So here in this in this ohel, in this room that's been created, we have two very important chassidim here. These two guys. This is the Magid of Mezrich. It says, Ponifta, here lies Harav Hamagid mi Mezrich, Rabbeinu Dov Be uh, Ben Rabbi Avraham. And uh, the Magid of Mezrich was really the figure who, according to the legends, really took all of the Baal Shem Tov's teachings. He was his primary student and he helped to disseminate them. And he had many, many Hasidim who each went off and interpreted uh, Hasidism in their own way and created all the different dynasties and uh, lineages of Hasidim. But the Magid of Mezrich was really the primary disciple of the Baal Shem Tov. And a, an important student of his was this guy. Reb Zusha, Reb Zusha of Hanipol, who was uh, quite a character from the stories and uh, a very zealous, uh, pious kind of soul who was just always bursting into tears at um, the wonder of it all. There's a beautiful story about how the Magid of Mezrich first became a disciple of the Baal Shem Tov. He was a very learned man, very versed in all of the rabbinic texts, there's, you know, the, the, um, the Talmud and also uh, Kabbalah and the Zohar and everything. And he'd heard all of these rumors about this great man, the Baal Shem Tov, and wanted to kind of check him out. So he went to Mezhibosh and um, booked a room in an inn and uh, really went straight to the Baal Shem Tov and just sort of greeted him, hardly looked at his face and just waited for the Baal Shem Tov to to start teaching and talking and he would know whether he was the real thing or whether it was all just made up stories. And the Baal Shem Tov, after a moment silent, just says, you know, once I was on a very, very long journey and I had no bread to feed my coachman. And then suddenly on the way, there was a peasant who gave us bread for the coachman. And then he stopped talking. And the Magid of Mezrich just went back to the inn and was like, what was that all about? And didn't get anything from that teaching and was frustrated and all these stories and the long journey he'd made to visit this great man and, and wasn't getting it. And so the next, the next night he went again into the presence of the Baal Shem Tov and the similar thing happened. The Baal Shem Tov looked at him and said, you know, once while I was traveling on the road, I had no hay to feed my horses. And then as we were going along on our way, a farmer stopped us and gave hay to the horses. And then he bid the Magid of Mezrich, who well, wasn't the Magid of Mezrich yet, he was the uh, Rabdov bear, <laughs> greeted him good night. And that was enough. <laughs> that was enough. Rabdov bear said, you know what? This is crazy. All of these stories about this man. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He told his coachman to get the horses ready. He was going to leave town that night. He was going to wait until the moon scattered the clouds in the sky and they were going to set off under the full moon. And as soon as the moon came into the sky, a messenger came from the Baal Shem Tov and said, my master wants to see you. And so Reb Dov Bear went into the presence of the Baal Shem Tov and the Baal Shem Tov to him said, uh, so you know a little bit of Kabbalah? You know some of the secrets? And Rab Dov Bear said, yeah, I know, I know Kabbalah. So he said, open this book. And he handed him a book called Eitz Chaim, the Tree of Life. And he said, read it. And he started reading it. And he said, now think. And he stopped and he thought. And he said, now explain, expound, explicate what you're reading. And it was a passage all about the secrets of the angels. And the Magad of Mezrit started explaining it. And the Baal Shem Tov looked at him and said, you know, everything you said is right, but you don't have any real knowledge at all because you're not really feeling it. Sit down and listen. And the Baal Shem Tov started explaining the same text that Reb Dov Bear had just read. And suddenly the whole room was consumed in fire. Fire came down and then the, the Rab Dov Bear heard the, the voices of angels filling the room and filling his head and he was in such a frenzy he passed out. And then when he came back to consciousness a little bit later on, the room was exactly as it had been before. And he looked up at the Baal Shem Tov and realized that this man really had some great and very deep and important secrets. 
and he went back to the inn and told his coachman and his entourage to go home and he stayed. He stayed in Mejibhoj and became a really important follower of the Baal Shem Tov. And then there's a story told about uh, when, just before the Baal Shem Tov died, and uh, all of the Hasidim, all of the closest disciples of the Baal Shem Tov will say, well, who's going to be your successor? Who's going who's to take over after, after you're gone? And, and the Baal Shem Tov said, uh, the person who can really understand the secret of pride and how to overcome pride. And so they asked around some of the some of the Hevre, some of the Hasidim, and some of them asked uh, the Magid of Mezrich, Reb Dovber, and they said, well, what's the secret of pride? And he said, pride belongs to God. As it says in the verse, Geut Lavesh, God is clothed, God is, is robed in pride. It's not for us to understand pride. All we can do is struggle with it, and struggle with it, and struggle with it all of our lives. And because of that answer. Apparently everybody who was there at the time knew that this man who recognized that pride was something that we always have to overcome, he was the one who was going to take over the mantle and become the, the leader of the next generation. And so it was, according to the stories. So it is uh, early morning and we are uh, just outside the town center of Bodichev um, in, the, in the, uh, the old Jewish cemetery and behind us here is the Ohel, the, the place where Reb Levi Yitzhak of Bodichev, a great uh, Hasidic uh, master, student of, and disciple of the Magad of Mezrich, is, is buried over here. And I'm here with uh, Heschel. 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 Boketov. Heschel. And, uh, Heschel uh, very lovingly looks after this place and is uh, one of just 250 uh, Jews that still live in uh, Bedichev. He was born in Bedichev in 1940 and uh, at one time this was the second largest Jewish population in the whole region. There were 50,000 Jews here and uh, they, the whole town was rounded up and 38,000 Jews were, were shot dead right here in Bedichev and um, some of them remained. And Heschel, uh, Boker Tov, good morning. Boker Tov, good morning. Uh, Heschel doesn't speak very much Hebrew or English, he speaks uh, Yiddish and Russian, and I don't speak much Yiddish and Russian, so we're going to try and have a conversation. Um, as um, Sie sind uh, Yiddish, Yiddish. All, his, all of his family were Jewish, all his family were born here in Bedichev. Zayde, 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 Oh, his, his great, great, great grandfather Davind uh, prayed with, with Rabbi Levi Yitzhak in his shul. So I'm sitting by the, the grave here of Reb Levi Yitzhak of Bodichev. And what's one of the things that's amazing about this grave here, this simple metal state, uh, slate, this, this simple metal plaque here that uh, remembers Rabbi Levi Yitzhak is that it's actually got his name with the name of his mother. It says Rabbi Levi, Rabbi Levi Yitzhak ben Sara, um, the Rabbi Levi Yitzhak, the, the son of Sara, Sarah. And from what I've understood, um, many, many people have used the figure of Levi Yitzhak as a a focus of their prayers and traditionally when we say prayers for healing we we use the name of the mother and and somehow that that female line has a, has a strength and a power and I've heard many people when they really need help people who grew up in um, I have a Holocaust survivor that I know in, in my community back in Colorado who, who, who used to say whenever you know she was always brought up in her family 
whenever they needed real help, whether it was for healing or something else, they'd, they'd pray to Elohe, uh, Rabbi Levi Yitzhak Ben Sara, pray to the God of Levi Yitzhak of Ben Sara, because he had a very strong connection to, to prayer, to Davenan, to, um, that was a big part of what he did. He had a, a fervent, unshakable kind of faith. So we are standing in this uh, Ohel, in this sanctuary here for this man, Reb Levi Yitzhak of Badichev, also known as the Kedushat Levi, after the, the book that he wrote, a very deep book of interpretations of the Torah. And so many of the stories of Levi Yitzhak are, are stories about faith and stories about prayer, and even stories about tefillin, which I'm wearing here. I just uh, finished finished davening, finished saying my, my morning prayers by uh, Levi Yitzhak. And there's so many people who have left, more than I've seen in the other graves, there's so many people who have left kvitlech, left the little notes, because there's a sense that Levi Yitzhak really has a power um, somehow to answer prayers. There's some wonderful stories about him. One of my favorite ones is that in the town of Bedichev there was a, a Jew who was very outspoken about the fact that he was a complete atheist, didn't believe in God at all. And one day Rabbi Levi Yitzhak went up to him and said, you know something? I don't believe in the same God that you don't believe in. I don't believe in the same God that you don't believe in. Which I think is a, a fascinating concept because sometimes we get so stuck in a fixed notion of what God is or what could, God could be or how God acts in the world that we, we don't explore the possibility as many of the Hasidim did and certainly as Reb Levi Yitzhak did that you know maybe the God that we think is up there that's not doing what we think God should be doing is not real therefore we have no faith so Reb Levi Yitzhak challenged that there's a story about him one, one time he was on a journey and he came to an inn um, you know, half a day's journey out of Bedichev, and there was a group of traveling merchants there, and uh, simple, simple people that they all wanted to, to daven in the morning. There was only there was just one set of tefillin uh, in the inn, and so one by one they would put on the tefillin, and then they'd say their prayers, and they'd go no 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 and at the end of the service, he went up to them, he went, and they didn't know who he was, they didn't know that he was this great, this great rabbi, this disciple of the Maggid of Mezrit, someone who would have known the Baal Shem Tov. And they looked at him like he was crazy, and he just said to them, and they said, well, I'm sorry, what are, you, what are you trying to say? We don't, we don't understand you. And he said, well, that's how you were just talking to God. You expect God to understand you? And then... Uh, they sort of got what he was trying to teach them about the nature of their prayers and um, just this mumbling, this rote mumbling that sometimes is perhaps uh, not what prayer should be about. But then one uh, young man who was there, he said, you know something, Rabbi? Have you ever listened to a young child? A young child who goes, ma, 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 ba, 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 the words don't seem to make any sense, but you know something? That child's mother or that child's father knows exactly what that child wants. And that's how it is with us. And when Reb Levi Yitzhak heard that answer, he was so happy, he just danced with joy. And then from then on, whenever he heard people praying, in whatever way they were praying, he just sort of accepted that on some level they were communicating in the way they communicated.